The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, church family. It feels so good to be with you this morning. So, spoiler alert, Bobby's going to be talking about gratitude some in his sermon, so I thought I would jump the gun and tell you something that I am continually, continually grateful for, and that is for you, our church family, for you, our church family on our power all over the globe, I am so grateful that I get to be around people who worship God with their lives. I am so grateful I get to be around people who have eyes to see past the material world. My children get to be around you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. Would you turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Here at Shepherd's Grove in Hour of Power, we believe the moment you walk through the doors or the moment you tune into this program, you really become a part of this spiritual family. We want you to know how blessed we are to have you join us in worship. As part of our family, we want to pray for, encourage, and connect with you. So we've created brand new resources that we hope will inspire and uplift you every day. Today, we wanna to send you this five by five card with the words from John 3, 16. Bobby and I want this card to be a reminder of how much God loves you and the sacrifice he made in sending his own son for you. That's right, Hannah and I hope you'll reach out and connect with us so we can better encourage you. Please call, write, or go online today. And as a thank you, we'll send you this John 3, 16 card. Remember always, God loves you, and so do we. Well, good morning. We're so glad you're here. I want to give a special welcome to the director of our Dutch ministry, Chris Timms, is here. Chris, will you raise your hand so people can say hello? Our Dutch, Dutch ministry is doing a, amazing. Is there anybody here, incidentally, from Holland? Yeah, welcome. Goeie morgen. Goeie morgen. Welcome. Almost every week we have visitors from the Netherlands, and, well, from all around the world. So wherever you're from, we're so glad you're here. And believe that when you leave here, maybe you came today hurting. Maybe you came to church, you need a word from God. Maybe today you just, you need a miracle. We're going to believe that today you're going to receive that thing from God that you need. He loves us. He even cares about the little things. You think God doesn't care about these little things in your life? He does. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've gathered us here, that you love us. And we thank you that today is going to be a good day because you're a part of it. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
In preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord found in Luke 17. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Grateful hearts are magnets for miracles. Amen.
With us today is Daniel Fusco, lead pastor of Crossroads Community Church, and he's the author of Upward, Inward, and Outward. Would you please welcome with me Daniel Fusco. Hi. Great to see you. I've got your book right here. It's terrific. People love it. And uh, it's not your first book, but I know a lot of people are really saying it's making a big difference in their life. And I, I want to ask you about it today. But first, let's talk a little bit about your ministry. You're the pastor of a very large church. Uh, it's a mega church, actually, in Portland, Oregon, which is not the kind of place you expect to see a mega church. No, it's not. And when you took it over, the guy who was there for a number of years who built it sort of handed it off to you in this process, and uh, under your leadership, it's grown substantially. Is that right? Yeah, it's been a really amazing uh, experience to take over for uh, a very regal founding pastor who faithfully pastored that church for 40 years, and to see what God is doing in this next phase of what God is doing at Crossroads, it's really humbling to be a part of. You must be thrilled to know, too, that he handed it off to someone like you, who's very different looking, different preaching style, but same heart, right? Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful because our founding pastor is still a part of Crossroads. Uh, his family is still a part. His son is still part of our executive team. And he's a, it's amazing to have uh, my older brother who is for me, who speaks into my life, who yeah. helps me uh, not hit certain potholes along the way in ministry. And so I, I feel really honored to be a part of it. So you weren't always like, you didn't grow up, you know, wanting to be a pastor, right? I mean, you had kind of an interesting journey to this to becoming a believer, right? Yeah, when I tell people I'm a pastor, they're like, really? You know, it's just, it's not their normal response. So I was playing music professionally. I played the upright and the electric bass, and uh, God really started to redirect me in my college years, and I ended up uh, apprenticing for ministry in my early 20s. Wow. Yeah, so you went from that to being a pastor. Why did you want to be a pastor if you loved music and, and all this stuff? I mean, how did that even happen? Well, you know, as I was uh, growing in my faith, and Jesus was really doing a work in my life, he showed me that music was a gift he had given me that he wanted me to use for him, but it wasn't supposed to be my identity. And he says, I really have called you to something else. And, and it was to, you know, what I realized, I love music so much, but music will give someone joy for a moment. And, uh, and, and as you re recollect on that music, you're like, oh, that really blessed me. But Jesus gives you joy for eternity. So I still get to play a ton of music, and I get to use music uh, for Jesus. But, you know, like God's really said, I've given you a voice that I want you to use uh, as, to teach my word. And so I was like, uh, okay, let's do that. <laughs> so. so the funny thing is you've got this big church, but the irony is that you didn't really set out to reach church folks. You were kind of like out to get people that are not religious to use your dreadlocks and your other superpowers to convince people <laughs> that, you know, that, that this message really is for, for everyday uh, people. And so you talk about like preaching on the street and, and the way you preach, right? Yeah, so I mean, even within the church, you know, as you're teaching about Jesus, no matter where someone is on their journey, whether they've been walking with Jesus for decades, Jesus is the most relevant, important person. The message of the Bible is, it's our hope. And so what I've learned is that, you know, even as preaching in a large church and an established church, I still use, you know, biblical language, but common language, and it reaches people. I mean, where we're living, we see people starting to follow Jesus. They've never even been in church before. And so it's kind of a beautiful thing to see these solid, grounded saints, and then these brand new babies, and, uh, and watch the work of what God is doing. I, I love, too, the, this, in your book, you talk about upward, inward, outward. And this is your way of teaching the greatest commandment. And I love your preaching style because it's, it's about just keeping it simple, not simplistic, but not getting hung up on all this other stuff, but focus on these three things and doing them well. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Well, like everybody, there's a million things we can do. We live in a world of opportunity, but... I want to make sure I get the main thing, the main thing. And so they asked Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the greatest teacher who ever lived, greatest person who ever lived. He said, what's the greatest commandment? And he answered them. And so I figured to myself, if the greatest person who ever lived, the wisest person who ever lived, he said, this is the most important thing. I want to get it right. And so, and I figured if I get that thing right, really a lot of the other details that I get caught up on actually gets caught into this idea of loving God, which is what I call upward. And then this, you know, this, the second commandment is you love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor is outward. Loving others as yourself. God's love teaches you how to love yourself and live with yourself in a way that's really beautiful. So what I've just found is it's a great way to, to, to look at every day. Yeah. And I, I think the last thing you said that was important, it all begins with, I mean, we got to be careful about how we say this, but loving yourself in, in the sense of loving yourself the way God loves you, like not being angry, not beating yourself up. We're actually talking about that today at length. 
Yeah. And that was a big part of your journey, too, because to go from this kind of straight-laced pastor to just kind of being you the way you are, not feeling like you have to pretend or be a different person, that was an important part of, I think, you succeeding, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, nobody likes somebody who is inauthentic. I mean, we can see it from a mile away. And so what I love is our founding pastor. I remember when, I, when he first invited me, I felt like my, my little kids, and they'll put their little hand in my hand. And, and they'll say, oh, Dad, your hand is so big. And I was thinking about our founding pastor and, and how God used him. And I was kind of like my little kid, like sizing up my little shoe next to this huge footprint. And I felt like the Lord ministered to me. He said, Daniel, I'm not asking you to fill his shoes. I'm just asking you to honor the footprint and make another footprint. And that really freed me to, to realize that like, we're all unique in God's kingdom. We're all individual parts of his body. And so God wants to use me the way he wants to use me. And I just want to, I'm blessed to stand on the shoulders of such a powerful ministry. And it really set me free to be uniquely who God made me to be and, and to let God do what he wants to do in this generation. Awesome. Daniel Fusco, thank you so much for coming down here today. The book is Upward, Inward, and Outward. Check it out. It's a great work. Daniel, thank you so much. God loves you. Pleasure. So do we. God bless you. Appreciate you. Hannah and I are so happy you've joined us in worship today. We hope that you have found incredible hope and inspiration in this program. We're in a message series based on my new book, You Are Beloved, Living in the Freedom of God's Grace, Mercy, and Love. Based on the creed of the beloved, this book is my desire to share how my life was radically changed when I began reciting this creed on a daily basis. Every week we say this creed, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. By resting in God's boundless and unconditional love, you too can fully experience the blessings God intends for us. When we embrace our position as beloved children of God, we will experience our true identity, allowing us to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow God's call on our lives. Oh, that's right. You know, practicing this creed was like changing the dial on my life by one degree. At first, I didn't really notice any change, but over time, by training and aligning my mind with the Word of God through, through praying this creed, I found a deep sense of rootedness. Tap into the godly energy, joy, love, and power found in the kingdom of God and experience the creed of the beloved in your life. Call, write, or go online today and request Pastor Bobby's new book, You Are Beloved, Living in the Freedom of God's Grace, Mercy, and Love. Based on the creed of the beloved, Pastor Bobby shares his personal experience of praying and practicing this creed daily. In this book, each chapter will guide and encourage you as you practice this creed in your own life. By living out the creed of the beloved, you'll discover the energy and motivation to do great things for God. We're asking for a generous gift of any size, so call, write, or go online today. Your generous gift of $60 will include the book and two-disc You Are Beloved, You Are Free DVD set. This Best of Bobby's Beloved series contains four messages to guide and encourage you to embrace your identity as God's beloved child. In addition, Bobby and Hannah are excited to announce that a group of Our of Power friends have created a matching challenge. Whatever gift you give today will be matched dollar for dollar to go twice as far to share this life-affirming truth of God's love with people in need. Call, write, or go online today. Thank you for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. Now, let's return to the service. From a tiny green island in the bluest of seas, we've traveled the world throughout history. Taverns and bustle to the streets of New York. You'll find someone Irish in every city and port. And though we may wander from the south and the north, we carry on when life steers us off course. And rivers of memories flow through your veins, and the heartbeat of home is calling your name. Oh, 
us abroad. Don't ever forget it, Aaron abroad. So I'll bring the stories and you bring the laughs, and we'll drink till the morning like no time has passed. Here we go. Gather near, gather far, wherever you are. In the name of Kate and Neil, I fall down. It's to you. Come along, say slancha. Come along, say slancha. In the name of Kate Millifancha. Gather near, gather far, wherever you are. In the name of Kate Millifancha. Here's to you. Thank you, Chloe Agnew. So great to have you in church today. And thank you, all our musicians, Mark, and all you guys. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, Chloe. So great. Well, one of the things that we do every single Sunday is we say this creed together. Would you stand with me? Hold your hands out as a way of receiving like this. And let's say this together. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Well, today we're talking about that one sentence we just said in the creed. I'm not what I have. We're in a series on my book that's just come out, and I'm very proud of it, and it's on this creed. This creed that we say every single week. Uh, I wrote it for myself, and I began praying it into my life. And I watched as it changed the way I act, the way I felt, actually more than almost any other discipline, writing and proclaiming this creed for months. As I, like every time I prayed, before I had like dinner, before I had like a quiet time, did so much to get the message of grace into my heart by saying it to myself in plain language. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. Um, it, it transformed my life that when we actually, back in the day, did a series then on love, and I incorporated this, many people in this church and on the Hour of Power began to say it in their own lives and got that same testimony that I finally realized we need to say this every week. And Gosh, we've been saying it now for years, haven't we? And testimony after testimony, we hear from people that say praying and believing in that creed did more for my life. To get the word of God in my heart through that kind of a prayer, I think it makes a big difference. So, uh, so today we're, we're carrying on on that creed so that you really can believe it when you say it. And last week we talked about I'm not what I have. I'm going to talk more about that today. 
about how we truly believe in a world full of splendor, wealth, treasures, and oh yeah, lots of money. How when we don't have any of those things, we can still say, I have enough and I am enough. And on the reverse, when we're fortunate enough to be the people that have wealth or success, that we don't tie our identity to those things, that we see ourselves as stewards and have a sort of inner fortitude to know that when all those things go away, when they all go back in the box, I still have the greatest treasure in the world, the love of God in Christ Jesus. So today we're going to talk about that, what it means to say truly, I am not what I have. And, and I want to tell you that the best way to do that is through, is through being thankful. Now, before I get into that, many of us feel a sense of scarcity, lack, not enough time, always tired, wish there were more hours in a day, wish there were more days in a week and weeks in a year, right? Many of us, we wake up every day and we do this like thing where we're just feeling constantly behind all day. I don't know about you, but I do this alarm clock math almost every single time I go to bed. You know, you have to get up at six and you stayed up a little later than you thought because you're watching Hour of Power. (laughs) And you, you, you set your alarm clock and you look and it's like, okay, I've got, it's 11.36 and I gotta get up at six. That means I'm gonna have six hours and you're like, well, maybe I can add a little bit if I, and you do this kind of thing, anybody do that? Maybe I'm the only one. And so you already know going to bed, you're not going to get enough sleep. And then you think, well, maybe I can hit the snooze button or skip my shower. Oh, yeah, you never skip your shower. Yeah, right. <laughs> maybe I can do this or that and, you know, kind of get a little extra time. And no matter what, I'm going to be tired tomorrow. There's a great line uh, from Lynn Twist in her book on money. And she describes this feeling so perfectly that many of us feel. She said, for me and for many of us, our first waking thought of the day is, oh, I didn't get enough sleep. The next one is, I don't have enough time. Whether true or not, that thought of not enough occurs to us automatically before we even think to question or examine it. We spend most of the hours and days of our lives hearing, explaining, complaining, or worrying about what we don't have enough of. Before we even sit up in bed, before our feet touch the floor, we're already inadequate, already behind, already losing, already lacking something. And by the time we go to bed at night, our minds are racing with a litany of what we didn't get or what we didn't get done that day. And we go to sleep burdened by those thoughts and wake up to the reverie of lack. This internal condition of scarcity, this mindset of scarcity, lives at the very heart of our jealousies, our greed, our prejudice, and our arguments with life. By the way, that feeling is not limited to just poor people. And it's not limited to parents, and it's not limited to busy people. It's it's even at the highest levels of success and wealth in America. Recently, Simon Sinek, who's a sort of a world leader and speaker, influencer, he tells a story about how he's invited to a gathering of some of the most wealthy and influential people in the world. It was a small group of maybe 250 people, and I believe it included like Elon Musk and Bill Gates and others. And in that meeting, the small group of wealthy people by the teacher in the group was asked, how many of you have reached your financial goals? Almost every hand in that room, he said, went up in the air. And then the teacher said, keep your hands in the air. And then he asked a second, very similar question. How many of you feel successful? And friends in that room of billionaires and world changers and world shakers and kings and leaders, nearly every hand went down. Scarcity is not something that only the poor people, that only poor people feel. Scarcity is something we all feel. And we all feel it if we live even a moment without the Lord. Scarcity is this thing in us that no matter how much we get, we feel like I'm always behind. I need more time. I'm not healthy enough. I need more. 
And sort of wrapped into that is this idea that I'm not enough. If you're not happy when you have a little, don't count on being happy when you have a lot. That's the lesson we learn. The good news, friends, is no matter how much you have, you don't have to live a scarce life. No no matter how much time you have left, no matter how unhealthy or poor you are, the good news is you don't have to live one moment without lack. There is one thing, and it's the simplest thing in the world, this one thing. If you practice this one thing, you'll have more joy than anybody you've ever met. You'll have a deeper sense of fulfillment. And yes, you will even attract miracles, opportunity, possibility into your life. And this one thing, this one, one thing is gratitude. It's all through the scriptures. It's the whole reason we gather here on Sunday morning is to say thank you. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what my storm is, I can say to the Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. And when we do that, when we say thank you to the Lord, when we say thank you to our neighbor, when we say thank you to the people we work with and live with, we open our whole life to heaven and to a flood of miracles. That's what a grateful person is. A grateful person is a magnet, a magnet for miracles. You just watch. When you begin to practice gratitude in your life, all those feelings of lack, all those feelings of fear, like I don't have enough to retire, all those feelings of not having enough health or enough time or enough money, they're greatly diminished and can even go away entirely as that empty chasm is replaced with satisfaction, satiation, joy. Gratitude, it's our faith, it's our songs, it's our life, and it's how we train ourselves to have the eyes that we need to see what's happening in the spirit see the Lord at work. Gratitude is exactly what we read about today in the scripture reading from Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. A story about Jesus who heals ten guys, but only one comes back to say thank you. And the question, many of us know the story, the question I want to ask in the story is, why did that one guy come back? Why did the other nine not come back? I mean, I understand that the message is to be grateful, But clearly something was unique about that one guy. What was it? Well, the story goes like this. You know, in Jesus' day, it was really a bad lot to be a leper. And by the way, leprosy wasn't limited to just legit leprosy like we have today. Like if you had eczema or peeling skin, didn't really matter. You could be deemed a leper. And this is maybe, as a Jewish person, one of the worst things that could happen in your life. If you just had bad dandruff one day, your head got sunburned. Some priest that doesn't like you could be like, oh, he's, he's got leprosy. Away with him. And they would put you in a leper colony. Can't go to synagogue anymore. Can't marry. Can't be around your family. You basically are dead to your old life. And you're now going to live a new life in a colony of lepers who are in abject poverty and are in social loneliness. If lepers need to go to the store or something like that, they have to shout as they walk, I'm a leper, I'm a leper. There were some rules in place, like lepers weren't allowed to be within 50 feet of anybody else that was quote unquote clean. So to become a leper is is a death sentence in a way. For Jews, the only thing worse than being a leper is being a Samaritan. Now, we we, uh, think of Samaritans as a good thing. You have hospitals called Good Samaritan. But in Jesus' day, Samaritans... They were this, they were the result historically of the invasion of Syria. The Assyrians came in and conquered the northern part of Israel, and then, like in Braveheart, I just thought of it, they're like, they're gonna breed them out. So the Assyrians began marrying into the Jewish families, and these northern Jewish people become the result of a mix of these horrible, murderous group called the Assyrians plus Jews. And so out of that comes this new group, the Samaritans. And their southern neighbors, the Jews, hated them because they had sort of like a half gospel. You know, it was like, a half, it was a Torah, but it wasn't tw- quite Jewish. They had a Zion, but it wasn't Zion. It was Gorazim. It was a different mountain. And they had all these things that were similar, but not the same. And it's amazing how that kind of a thing for human beings, to be similar, but not the same, can cause the greatest kind of prejudice and hate, can it? It's weird. At any rate, 
Samaritans were hated by Jews, and Samaritans were certainly not allowed to go to the temple in Jerusalem. And Samaritans and Jewish rabbis like Jesus certainly wouldn't have associated. So all those things are important when we hear the story. And the story is like this. Here's Jesus. He's walking. He says, says between Galilee and Samaria. Okay, so he's walking between the Jewish side and the Samaritan side. He's walking along. He goes to a village. And of course, at this point, he's famous. He's done amazing things. Everybody thinks of him as a miracle worker. And so when these lepers who need to be healed see that their opportunity has come, notice they don't walk up to him. What do they do? They shout from a long distance, right? Because they're not allowed to come close to Jesus. They're unclean. So they're shouting at him, like, Jesus, Jesus, like, please heal us, have mercy on us, mercy. Jesus looks at them, and he tells them to do something weird. Instead of just going and healing them, he walks to all ten of those guys. Nine are Jewish, one is Samaritan, all of them have leprosy. And they're all friends, by the way, which is interesting. It's interesting how our suffering can bring us together in our prejudice, isn't it? So he says to these ten guys, all right, all ten of you, Go to Jerusalem and show yourself to the priests at the temple. Now, that's a long walk, friends. That is a long walk from where they are. But all of them are excited because to show yourself to the, to the temple priest in Levitical law, that's how you get reinstituted back into society. You get to go back to your family, back to synagogue, once you get basically like a DMV check on your body. You know, you're like, yep, no leprosy, he's good. Got some head and shoulders. And so you, you find that these 10 guys are like, okay, great, we're going. And then there's this moment of truth for the Samaritan. He was in the group that was spoken to, but Samaritans aren't supposed to go to the temple. So what does he do? Is he like, oh, Jesus, hey, look, can I go to my temple at Gorazim? It's the other way. But still, doesn't do that. He just receives the word from God and believes. He believes, but he believes differently than the other nine guys who believe. Those nine guys are like, I'm going to the temple, I'm going to get healed. This guy believes, but says, I'm abandoning the outcome to God. And so the Samaritan walking with his friends, you can almost imagine they're like, Joe the Samaritan, are like, Joe, what are you doing? You're going to go to the temple, dude? Joe, what are you doing, man? You're going to go in the temple? You're going to walk up to... To John the priest and tell him to check you. What are you doing? He's like, he told me to go, guys. He told me to go. He told me to go. I'm just gonna try it out and see what happens. You know, I don't know. What if some? I don't know. What if something? I don't know. Joe, I can't wait to see you walk up to that priest. I can't wait. This is literally this is what's going on. Here's his ten guys on like a probably two day walk down to the temple, and what the amazing thing happens? What's the amazing thing? That even though he's a Samaritan, that even though he's not supposed to be where all those religious people are, God heals him anyway. Even though his theology is wrong, even though his worldview is wrong, even though he's got it all wrong, he simply decided to believe that what God said was true, even though he was an outcast and he received his miracle. At no point was that man feeling entitled to a miracle. He just wanted it enough to take a risk and to believe that this Rabbi Jesus might have loved him too. That's a good word, friends. That is a good message. And that is why one man and one man alone returned to say thank you. He was the only one who wasn't entitled. Those other nine, that Samaritan walking with them was a joke. Yeah, right. No way God's going to heal a Samaritan. When they got healed, they got the thing they expected to get. When he got healed, he got a surprise. And tears rolling down his eyes that this Jesus rabbi would heal him in such a way. He didn't go back to his family first and hug them like he wanted to. He didn't go back to his, his old village and go back to business yet. He didn't do any of those things yet. The first thing he did was run to Jesus and fall on his knees and say, thank you. Why? Because he alone abandoned the outcome to God. He walked in faith in every moment, but he wasn't entitled to a specific outcome. He just believed. He just believed, and he lived by hope. That's a good word. And that's why, friends, we need to be thankful people. 
even if you expect it to happen, even if you believe with all your heart, and you believe and you get the exact thing that you had hoped, be thankful, always. And watch as being a thankful person turns you into a magnet for miracles. Grateful people are a magnet for miracles. You want to succeed in life? You want to achieve more? You want to do more? Practice gratitude. You feel like there's not enough jobs or opportunity or you're not getting enough orders or whatever. Start practicing gratitude. And watch as when we're thankful to the Lord for what we have, how he just opens up heaven to us. My grandpa used to say, don't focus on what you've lost. Focus on what you have left. And watch how God is able to use that. It's like this. I remember... My daughter, she's a little girl, you know, and she loves playing, on, playing games on my phone. Like, like, my, like me, I like video games. Anyway, that's embarrassing, I know. Your pastor likes video games. <laughs> so she loves to play games on my phone, and, you know, there's this new thing, you know, with phones where you get a free game, but you sort of have to pay for it as you go along. So I downloaded the My Little Pony app for free, and they let her play the first land for free. There's ten lands. But if you want to unlock each land, you got to pay a dollar each time. So she comes to me, because I hate paying for stuff for games. And she's like, Dad, can you please, please, please unlock just one land. It's just a dollar. I'll work for it. I'll do whatever you need me to do. Please, just open up one land. And she was so sweet about it. And I was like, all right, I'll open up a land. So I open it up, and I look through. And right away it says, open up one land for one dollar or open up all 10 lands for $3. And I'm like, well, hang on. I don't want to lose money. You know, this is like, this is a pretty good deal. And I said, hey, but why don't I just open up all of them? And you would have thought it was like the Angels won the World Series and the lottery, she won the lottery. And like, she like, eyes turned to saucers, jumps up and down, starts screaming. And I go, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. This cost me three dollars, friends. And I remember I, I was so like stoked. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, as she grows, I hope she doesn't stay this thankful or I'm going to be a poor man. <laughs> like every time, if she's this thankful when I give her something, I'm just going to be like, take all my money. Just take, take my car. <laughs> See, this is what we don't think about. We don't think about this when we, in our prayers to God and honestly in the way we thank our neighbor and our colleagues and our friends, we don't realize that thankfulness invites blessing probably more than anything else in the world. When you jump up, up and down and you thank God for just a good day, you're going to have more good days, friend. When you thank God for your family, when you thank God for your food, When you thank God for what you're going through in your life and what you have, just watch as more good comes into your life. Don't make it fake. Don't thank God for bad things that happen. He didn't send those things into your life. But when the good things happen, thank him. Now watch as heaven opens up. And there's so much blessing in your life. There's not enough room to contain it. Thankful people are magnets for miracles. Thankful people are world changers. Thankful people are just setting up in their future just a huge realm of opportunity and blessing and possibility. The opposite is also true. Thankless people always live in lack. Thankless people will never have enough. And more than anything, we all know a thankless person is a hurtful person. See, there's two types of sin. There's sins of commission and there's sins of omission. Sins of commission are things you do. You stab a guy, that's a sin of commission. You know, you rob a bank or flip somebody off, that's a sin of commission. But the sins of omission are the things we don't do that hurt people. Neglect. When you stonewall your spouse because you're angry at them, that's the sin of omission. When you, when you get cold towards your neighbor because they crossed you in a way, that's the sin of omission. You're choosing to, to, to not love them in a way that's culturally acceptable. And most of all, when someone does something for you and they do it with their heart and you, th- and you don't thank them, but you know you should, That's the sin of omission. Thankless people are hurtful people. They're entitled. And and it it, it is painful, isn't it, when you do something for someone? I know I've done this to people before. You forget to thank someone. You just feel horrible about it. And that's why we got to do our best to become the kinds of people that notice even the little things in our life so that those good little things will keep on coming.
Amen? And because a person deserves it. So, you say, Bobby, I can't be, a, you don't know what's going on in my life. My life is so bad right now, there's just, I have literally nothing to be thankful for. And that's hogwash. I want, it's not hogwash that your life is bad, I believe you there. But I do believe that some of the best times to be thankful are the times when we're going through hard times. You want to turn things around? Start practicing gratitude. So you say, man, life is hard. And there's this funny thing. I think many of us have a, a worse view of life than we need to have. A lot of that's coming from the news. There's this, uh, this guy, Sean Acor, who says many of us have medical school syndrome. Medical school syndrome is this thing where like first year medical students constantly think they're sick. As they're going through various diseases they could get, they're like, oh, I have a headache, and a headache is what you get when you have AIDS. <laughs> Ooh. You know, like they always think that these things, they're like these symptoms, and he was saying, he was talking to his brother-in-law who was medical, in medical school, and he called him, and he's like, Sean, I have leprosy. <laughs> he's like, what? I have leprosy, and he said, I didn't know how to console him because the week before, he'd just gone over, gotten over a whole month of menopause. <laughs> So this is what happens, right? You, if you're around negative people a lot, and especially if you watch the news, the news doesn't report when things are good, right? Except you, unless you're watching the Weather Channel in California. <laughs> It'll be 72 and sunny today. And the rest of the month, 72 and sunny. No, but, but many of us, we see the news about everything that's happening around the world. Well, everything in our personal life is fine. But you look at the news and you read the paper, it's like, oh, the world is falling apart, friends. It's not. Turn the news off, honestly. Just turn it off. Be, be around more positive people and, and fill your mind with the word of God. Study the word and study the hope. It, it says the last line about what's going to happen. You don't need to be afraid of anything. So no matter what's happening in your life, we can practice gratitude. Amen? Let me finish with this. There's three things you can do to be a more grateful person and invite miracles to your life. Three things in three minutes, are you ready? First one is become a tourist in your own hometown. I remember years ago, Hannah and I saved up a bunch of money to go to France, and it was like our dream come true. Taking us over, over a year to save up the money to kind of backpack through, bed, and we went to bed and breakfast and stuff in France and England, and every moment was amazing, and it was just so great seeing Europe, that when we finally got home, we were so sad. We had to come back to Orange, you know, and like in our home in Orange, and it was boring, and just same old, same old. And I remember it was that week, I was walking around, and I saw four Japanese people who were visiting from out of town, and they were taking pictures of everything in my hometown of Old Town Orange. They were taking pictures like the bench. They even came up and wanted a picture with me, and they weren't like, oh, you're Bobby Shuler. They were like, oh, you're a tall white guy. It was crazy. <laughs> and so they took a picture with me, and, and I like, talked to them, and they're like, your hometown is amazing. Did you know they filmed the wonders over there? Or not the wonders. Uh... Thank you. <laughs> they filmed that thing you do there, and he's going on and on. And I was like, hey, you're right. That is, and that is a cool tree, and that is a cool bench. And yeah, I do like that building. And I remember thinking, what if I could just be a tourist in my own town? What if I could stop and notice some of these great things that are in my life that I take advantage, or I don't take advantage of them. I take for granted, rather. I think many of us, we could be that way if we didn't hurry so much. So be a tourist in your own town. Number two, don't compare, ever. If you're a mom, don't compare yourself to other moms. If you're an accountant, don't compare yourself to other accountants. If, if you're a pastor in ministry, don't compare yourself to people in ministry, or a musician, or whoever you are. Don't compare, and especially don't compare your current life to your past life. Don't look back five years or 10 years or 20 years ago and say, it used to be like this. It used to be so much better. Don't do that. Just be where you are now. Be present and notice what you have. What a gift it is that you're alive, that you have friends, that you're in church. It's all a gift. We just have to have eyes to see it. And finally, number three, Thank people as often as you are able. And do it genuinely. Saying thanks is not really thanking someone. Saying, I'm thankful for you, or I'm thankful that you got so much foam on my cappuccino. That was the most bougie thing I've ever said. 
you get what I'm saying. The people in your life that you work with, who you talk to, that you say to them, I am thankful for you. Thank people even when they're supposed to do it. You don't want to thank your husband when he takes out the trash because he's supposed to do it. If I thank him, then he might think, oh, I don't really have to do this, right? That's the fear. I promise you, you start thanking your husband when he takes out the trash, he's going to take it out more, not less. Thank your employees when they do what they're supposed to do. Thank your colleagues when they help you out, even if they're supposed to help you out. Don't be entitled. Be thankful and be genuine about it. And watch as how being thankful brings more of those kinds of results that you want. Being thankful will open your eyes to see how blessed you are. And more than that, it'll even attract more blessing from heaven. If you feel like you're not enough, if you feel like you don't have enough, friend, I want you to know you are God's beloved. And no matter where you are now, your future is so bright, so wonderful. And I'll see you there at the end of the finish line. Amen. Amen. Lord, we are thankful. We truly are for all you've given us. And we love you. Amen. Please stay tuned for the closing benediction. Hannah and I are so happy you've joined us in worship today. We hope that you have found incredible hope and inspiration in this program. We're in a message series based on my new book, You Are Beloved, Living in the Freedom of God's Grace, Mercy, and Love. Based on the creed of the beloved, this book is my desire to share how my life was radically changed when I began reciting this creed on a daily basis. Every week we say this creed, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am, no one can take it from me. I don't have to worry, I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. By resting in God's boundless and unconditional love, you too can fully experience the blessings God intends for us. When we embrace our position as beloved children of God, we will experience our true identity, allowing us to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow God's call on our lives. Oh, that's right. You know, practicing this creed was like changing the dial on my life by one degree. At first, I didn't really notice any change, but over time, by training and aligning my mind with the Word of God through, through praying this creed, I found a deep sense of rootedness. Tap into the godly energy, joy, love, and power found in the kingdom of God and experience the creed of the beloved in your life. Call, write, or go online today and request Pastor Bobby's new book, You Are Beloved, Living in the Freedom of God's Grace, Mercy, and Love. Based on the creed of the beloved, Pastor Bobby shares his personal experience of praying and practicing this creed daily. In this book, each chapter will guide and encourage you as you practice this creed in your own life. By living out the creed of the beloved, you'll discover the energy and motivation to do great things for God. We're asking for a generous gift of any size, so call, write, or go online today. Your generous gift of $60 will include the book and two-disc You Are Beloved, You Are Free DVD set. This Best of Bobby's Beloved series contains four messages to guide and encourage you to embrace your identity as God's beloved child. In addition, Bobby and Hannah are excited to announce that a group of Hour of Power friends have created a matching challenge. Whatever gift you give today will be matched dollar for dollar to go twice as far to share this life-affirming truth of God's love with people in need. Call, write, or go online today. Thank you for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. Thank you, and remember always, God loves you. And so do we.
And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.